everything about Agatha Christie and things is it's strangely silly when viewed through the lens of someone who's actually been a real police officer because she's been at real crime scenes. I've been at real homicide scenes. I've been involved in homicide investigations and they're they're actually rather business like and rather dull and, and, and procedural. You know, it's not mm, I couldn't help notice that the candle had only burned down one inch when it should have burned down. No. This is the Ideas Lab podcast, where you can learn from great creative and entrepreneurial minds how to turn your ideas into original businesses, books, and brands. Because in a crowded world, it pays to stand out. This is your host, John Williams, best-selling author and founder of the Ideas Lab London. Stephen Colgan started his career as a police officer in London in the Met Police Problem Solving Unit, And now he's a comedy writer and has written for BBC programmes like QI and the Museum of Curiosity. And he's written several books, including most recently a comedy whodunit called A Murder to Die For. In this interview, you'll hear how the Met Police Problem Solving Unit solved a late night public order problem using lollipops. How Stephen transitioned from being a Bobby on the Beat to being a successful comedy scriptwriter to what it's like working with Stephen Fry, Sandy Toxvig and other legends of the British comedy scene. So Stephen, I'm going to ask you a dinner party question, which is, what do you do? Because you've got so many things that you do. I have, I'm have. i fascinated to hear how you answer this question. Yeah, it's, it's quite difficult when you're writing out a CV or a prime. Um, I suppose the main thing I do is I'm a writer because I write books and I have written TV shows and radio shows and that sort of thing. Um, but I do a lot of speaking as well. I, I speak at a lot of events and festivals and, um, and I also do a bit of illustration work now and again, although not so much these days. Um, I just generally do what I feel like doing or whatever people want to pay me to do. I mean, that's, that's the, that's the, that's the number of it. That sounds good. Artist, writer, speaker, but you started as a police officer, so you're in the you're in the uh, police force for thirty years. And what I find really interesting, so as a police officer, you ended up in the problem solving unit for the London Met Police. Eventually, yeah, yeah and it, that stuff I find fascinating. In fact, you wrote a book about it, which is called. Remind me. Which came out in hardback as "Why Did the Policeman Cross the Road?" Yeah. Then we had an issue in the fact that bookshops didn't seem to know where to store it. Some people were putting it in the joke section. Some people were putting it in the law section. Some were putting it in the smart thinking section, which is kind of where it should be, really, I suppose. Um, so when the paperback came out, they decided to reissue it with the title One Step Ahead, Notes from the Problem Solving Unit. And it seems to have done a lot better with the new title. Uh, yeah, I think that's probably better. So why don't you ex- what is, the, what, uh, is it still going, the Problem Solving Unit? No, it's not, but for reasons, I mean, for, for all the right reasons, I should say. All the problems are solved. Is that is that the right reason? I wish, I wish, and so does everyone else. No, the, the problem solving unit grew out of a need, which was basically there were lots of different, um, there were lots of different things going on in London at the time, or indeed worldwide at the time, where people's fear of crime was rising much faster than the actual crime rate was. And uh, the government at that time set a task for police to do something called reassurance policing, which was, you know, not only catching the bad guys, but also doing things to show people, actually, you know, you can do a little bit of policing with a small p yourselves to make yourselves feel safer. And it was also all about publishing data and facts to try and combat, you know, the sort of scary hysteria that the tabloids were putting up all the time. Um, And I became very interested in an emerging sort of area of science at the time, which was behavioral insights, behavioral economics, as people used to call it, um, which was actually playing with people's perceptions and behavior rather than just straight trying to catch the bad guy. I mean, if I can give you a, a, a simple example of this, if you've got, um, if you've got, say, burglaries happening in a certain area and you can try and catch the burglars, but that's not going to reduce people's fear of, fear of crime if as soon as you take one burglar out of the picture, another one slots in and takes their place because there's something about that area that makes it attractive to burglars. So what you do is you look at the problem holistically. You look at the pro- you look at um, the issue and say, is there anything you can do to change the venues to make them less likely to be burgled? And is there anything you can do to change the homeowners or the shop owners or, or you know the property owners' behaviours 
that would make them less likely to be the victims of crime. And what you do is you work in three different perspectives. You look at the offender, the victim, and the location and time as well. And and when you tackle the problem, as I said, I holistically it's kind of been as a word, it's been sort of nabbed, doesn't it, by the new by the new age. But but if you look at it as a whole, uh, Rory Sutherland, great behavioural um, insight guy, talks about it's the difference between doing a crossword and a Sudoku. Because crossword, you can you can hive off little bits and deal with the individual bits, in, you know, on their own. But with Sudoku, you've got to look at the whole problem as a whole. You can't solve any one part of Sudoku without solving the other parts. And that's that's a very good analogy because if you want to solve a problem of crime or something that affects the community, you've got to look at all those aspects. And so I got very interested in this, and I got involved in quite a few little uh, initiatives, a lot of them off my own back to see if I could make a difference, and, and they worked. Not only did crime come down, people felt safer, um, you know, communities felt safer. I got a lot more community engagement with the police as well, which is really helpful in terms of intelligence gathering. And a short while later, I mean, I, I have to say, I was, I'd been in the police for about 19 years at this stage, um, and then suddenly I got a phone call out of the blue saying, would I be, like to be part of a, a, a sort of experimental team, for want of a better name? Um, sort of based out of Scotland Yard, but probably working in different places all over London, um, with a bunch of other guys who and gals who thought similarly. And could we try using some of these things uh, on the ground? And we did. And it was hugely successful. Okay, so can you give us an example of that? Because what I love is the creativity involved and the, the kind of lateral thinking. Can you give us a nice example of something like that? The one that we often pull out of the bag to, to explain it, I mean, was the lollipop story, just because it was the most obviously successful example there was, there was an issue with um, noisy nightclubs kicking out and the community was moaning about the noise and the litter and disturbance and and police were having to go there every friday saturday night to deal with this and the arrival of the police would quite often g things up a little bit and there'd be a bit more violence than maybe there would have been if the police hadn't been there um and there were a number of other sort of uh, related side issues to do with um uh, the number of pregnancies and things like this that were happening as a result of drunk or wandering around the street, not being able to get a cab home and things like this. Um, so we went and looked at the problem and it quickly became apparent that the, because you tr- what you do is you, you normally when people say oh, disturbance outside a nightclub, they, they treat that as the problem. But of course, that's actually the symptoms of the problem. You've got to drill down and find out what the actual cause is. And then you find you've actually, it, fra- it fragments. You find you've got lots of little problems all of which you've got to cause, and you have to prioritise those. And the thing that seemed that was affecting people more than anyone else was noise. And, of course, that's the one aspect that police have got no power over because, you know, we don't carry little metres to register how many decibels they are. And even if we did, police have got no power to deal with noise. It's, it's a local authority issue with environmental health. People were coming out of the nightclubs and just yelling their heads off because they're all drunk. And the very loud. I mean, I mean, they're noisy because they're a little bit drunk, and they've been listening to really loud banging music for the last three hours. Um, you know, they might have taken a few things as well. You, you, and and particularly, it sounds awful. Sorry, this is not sexist, but when you've got groups of girls gathered together, because because women do tend to group together more than blokes do, their noises, their the noises they were making were really loud because, um, you know, as as you know, a, a higher voice travels further it cuts through more yeah it cuts it cuts through more um and women have higher voices than men you know that's just biology so we thought if we can just cut the noise down we reckon there'd be a substantial reduction in the number of complaints anyway so we thought about various ways of doing that one idea that was put forward was you know i mean we were throwing ideas around a table and and someone eventually said can't we just gag them or something <laughs> just we just you know, a nice idea, but it wasn't going to work. Then someone suggested we give them dummies when they come out, which I thought was quite funny. You know, that, that's what works for babies. And I thought, well, actually, that whole idea of, of something around the mouth to keep people quiet is an interesting idea. And we started off by trying bottles of water because people have come out of the club, they're a bit dehydrated. You know, and we thought it's a goodwill gesture by the bouncers to give them bottles of water. That was okay, except that we trialed this in, like, like I think it was, December or January, and there was a lot of spillage of water, and then we got ice slicks on the road, and people get in their clothing, and and then we thought about using toffees for a little while, giving out sweets, but then we there was a, a this is absolutely genuine, 
I had a senior officer say to me, I'm not going to be sued for people's fillings coming out. So, uh, so then we just hit on the idea of lollipops. We thought, let's give people lollipops when they came out of the club. Um, no expenditure to the public because the club provided them and probably, you know, if they have to do it on a regular basis, we'll build it into the ticket price as people go in anyway. And it worked phenomenally well. I can't tell you how well it worked. because So people get, get handed a lollipop on the way out of the club, start sucking on it, and they, they're no longer shouting their heads off. We've got a lollipop in the lap like this. It's really hard, it's really hard to be loud. And, um, and there was a sort of second view. I think, first of all, it kept the noise down. I think, I think it probably did some good as well in terms of, you know, getting people's blood sugars back up as well and things like that. But the, the secondary benefit, the thing we hadn't anticipated, which worked really well, was the amount of bad feeling drops, the amount of violence dropped almost overnight. Because blokes, when they've got a lollipop in their mouth, kind of feel a bit childish and a bit silly. and They're not quite so inclined to be punchy. And, and it was extraordinary. The results were, you know, it went from like 100 complaints a night down to like three. It was, it was really... So it wasn't just for noise. That's really interesting, isn't it? Because it's difficult to kind of look macho and start posturing when you've got a lollipop in your mouth, isn't it? Yeah, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. We thought this is a great idea. Um, You know, it turned out we weren't the originators of the idea. A a little bit later research showed that the oldest time lollipops have been used in a similar sort of circumstance that I found was five years before that in Canada. But it's just, you know, it's just one of those good ideas that just pops up as these things do sometimes. Um, but it worked, and more importantly, it spread. As news of it spread, other nightclubs started doing the same to the extent that they they started having they had started having lollipop themed nights and things like this. It was, and, and of course, what happened is you know certain tabloids got hold of it and police spending taxpayers' money on lollipops when they should be catching bad guys. But sorry, no, you're wrong. Police shouldn't be catching bad guys. Police should be stopping crime from happening because if you go out on the street and get a representative sample of as many people as you like, 500 people, and say, would you rather the police were good at catching bad guys or would you rather that you weren't the victim of crime, you weren't burgled, you weren't robbed? I know which one people would choose. And the thing is, you can't catch bad guys till they've done something wrong. It's almost, it's almost like when someone gets to the stage where they can be arrested, the police has failed to stop that crime from happening. It's almost a badge of failure for us. Uh, and trying to get out of that mindset is very difficult because a lot of people equate policing with just catching bad guys. But if you go back to the very origins of policing and Sir Robert Peel, you know, the, the the first ever mission statement for policing, which was written back in the 1840s starts. The very first sentence is the primary object of an efficient police is the prevention of crime. That's the very first sentence of of, this is what policing is for. The second sentence is all about the uh, apprehension and prosecution of offenders. If you failed the first bit, so it, yeah, I, I think most people would rather not be, yeah, unless they're a very strange person, uh, some sort of, say, they're masochist or something. I think most people would rather not be burgled, would rather not be robbed. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want to get, yeah, you, who cares whether they get caught, uh, you know, compared to just having it not happen. Yeah, it's not very sexy. You know, there's not police chases involved preventing crime. There's no, no you know, fighting with a bad guy and the, and the big dramatic court appearances. The whole point is you stop the crime from happening in the first place. Um, and of course, whenever there's um, cuts to the police, they won't take cops off the street if they can help it, because that just sends signals to the public, oh, look, we've got fewer police officers. But they will always take them from the backroom boys and girls, and it's the backroom boys and girls who are doing all the prevention work. So whenever there are cuts to police, you may see just as many cops on the street, but I guarantee them will go up as the prevention work stops. Yeah. I know, and yeah, I mean, well, we could get into the conversation about um, knife crime, but maybe that's just too complicated to get into. <laughs> it is. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's. Well, the first thing I will say is, yes, it is. It is a terrible thing, and it's a, it's an awful thing. And you know, the papers calling it an epidemic. You actually look at the actual figures; it hasn't actually risen substantially year on year. Um, it's just. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot more stabbings, but the number of fatal stabbings isn't substantially greater than it was 10 years ago. And in fact, if you go back to the 50s, um, there were a lot. There were just as many then. If you go back to the Victorian era, there were 10 times as many as there are now. You know, it's it's actually fairly it's actually fairly safe um, on the streets these days for for most people. Where it's where it's a lot dodgier is usually urban areas and usually young kids. 
it, it's very much a youth issue. This, um, you know, you you don't hear a lot of fifty year old men being stabbed. You know, it, it's mostly young, and there's there's an awful lot of factors involved in that. Um, uh, well, and it, it's interesting because everyone makes it about race, but in actual fact, as, as people point, uh, smart people have pointed out, it's um, it was a big problem in Glasgow, uh, uh, and it was mostly p- poor white kids, and they resolved yeah. that. There was an amazing work done in Glasgow to reduce knife crime. It was the knife crime capital of the UK, but you know it's it's up there, so it doesn't kind of impinge on you know the consciousness of of, of Westminster, sadly. Um, but yeah, that but that was that was all white kids killing each other in London. Yeah, there's been a predominance of particularly um, African Caribbean kids, both being the victims and the perpetrators. And um, people have said, "Oh, it's cultural, it's cultural." Well, maybe it was a little bit at the start, but it's not now because because that that has it, it's spread across the whole diaspora of, of kids. You know, it's there's as many white youth, white youths and brown youths and you know. Um, Oriental, Asian, whatever you want to call it, youth involved in this as anyone else now. But it's specifically a youth issue. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's, I mean, we could have a discussion just about that. But there are so many things I wanted to talk about. How did you go from being a police officer to being uh, a writer for QI, the TV, you know, it's a massive TV series in the UK with Stephen, used to be Stephen Fry fronting it. And then it was. Um, Sandy Toxic now. Oh, uh, Sandy Toxic's still doing it, yes. Yeah, it's still doing it. They've just finished recording the Q series now. Um, yeah, they might actually get to the end of the alphabet because because John Lloyd, when he first when he first put QI forward, he decided we won't do a series one. We'll do a series A. So the whole series is themed around the letter A, and every episode has got a particular A theme. And everyone thought, what? You think it's going to go for twenty six years? But you know, Stephen got halfway through the alphabet. He got to the thirteenth year. It's taken ever since, and they've just recorded the Q series. There is a possibility they might just get to the end of the alphabet. And how did you, um, what was the role you played in QI? Um, well, towards the end, because I, I left QI last year, um, towards the end, the last two or three years, I was one of the primary script writers. Now, we should say, QI isn't a scripted show per se. It's pretty much an improv show because the, the panel don't know what's coming up. They don't even know what the theme of the show is. They just turn up and are expected to, to be themselves because unlike a lot of other shows, panel shows, we don't expect people to know the answers the questions on QI. That's the whole point. But someone had to script what Stephen and Sandy would say. Uh, And what it involves is, first of all, finding lots of really interesting facts, then phrasing a question in a particular way that gives the panel plenty to play with for them to riff on. And then, of course, provide the answer and a few supplementary facts. And that was the job of the scriptwriters. There were eight of us, did two shows each. And... um, there's a large group of QI elves, as they call us, um, who were gathering in facts the same as we were. Then all those facts would come into a Monday morning meeting, but we'd sit around a table and we'd just bring in all the best facts we found that week. Um, in fact, if you know the QI podcast, No Such Thing as a Fish, that grew out of the fact that Dan Schreiber, one of the elves, was watching one of these meetings one day and how much laughter and how much fun there was as these great facts came in. He said, Do you know, we should just film this and put this out because I think the public would love it. And, and the podcast grew from that. It grew out from, um, you know, a bunch, of, a bunch of the elves just sitting around talking about the favourite fact they found that week. But what would happen is all the facts would come in, they then start to sort of naturally coagulate into clumps, you know, or that can go in a programme about animals, that can go into a programme about the military, that can go into what about artists and poets. or, And then eventually when you felt you had enough facts, you went away and you wrote a script. And the whole point of the script was to render the question down, as I say, into something that's just a bleak enough that it gives the panel something to riff with. Um, the example I often use is I found this great fact about ostriches who invented the radiator because what they do when they're running, you know, hot African countries, they're running along at speed, uh, their brains will quickly overheat. So what they've got is the basic, uh, basically a radiator. What they do is they take a mouthful of water, hold it in their crop just under here, and then when they're running, they push the water up into their mouth and they rapidly pant over the top of the water, and that cools the air in their mouth, which is, of course, the other side of the brain. Um, and that's a great fact. It's interesting, but you think, how can I ask a question about this? You can't just ask, how do I keep cool? You know, that's not going to give us to play with. So you start thinking, well, hang on a minute, we've got... We've got panting, breathing, 
water, damp, moist. You start playing a bit of word association. Eventually, ended up with, you know, uh, when is it cool to wet your pants? <laughs> because, because you've got all the elements there. You know, the, the ostrich is wetting its panting. It's wetting its pants. I go, and that's how it keeps cool. But, of course, that allows Alan Davis a chance to riff on, you know, something that happened to him when he was a Boy Scout and Ross Noble to go off into some insane aside. And, and, and then eventually the um, compare of the show will then drag it back. No, not those sorts of pants. Then it leads into ultimately the answer and that moment when everyone goes, all oh, right, wow, that's quite interesting. Um, so that's the job of the script writer. It, it's to actually formulate those questions and then to provide the, the actual facts in a an easily accessible way, plus a few supplementary facts that you can throw into the mix. Yeah. How did you get involved with QI? I mean, that's quite a roundabout route because... Well, yeah, I mean, curiously enough, the, the, the catalyst for it was Douglas Adams because I, I, a friend of mine was doing a charity run um, to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro to raise money for Save the Rhino. And he was doing it in a in this rhino suit that Save the Rhino has got that they that people run. Douglas did it at one time. And, um, and I helped him out with his charity materials and his gathering by doing some cartoons of him in a rhino suit. And um, the upshot of it was that several other people used that same cartoon. Um, and I started getting invited to a few Save the Rhino events, which is where I got to meet Douglas Adams. And, and as a result of that, I got to see him do some other things. I, I remember going to a lecture that he did once at the old Museum of the Moving Image when it was still going, um, where he was talking then about uh, moving from books into computer, he was so, as you know, massively interested in computers. He would have loved the internet, wouldn't he? He would have loved the internet, Douglas. Um, yeah, and he'd just done this um, computer game called Starship Titanic, which, and we were we were actually there at Momi doing the beta testing on it with him walking around Jaffa. So it was amazing. Um, and just as I got to know Douglas, um, he died. He died totally unexpectedly um, in 2001, which was which was awful. And uh, and I got invited to the there was a sort of special um, event to mark his life, which was an invite thing, which I got invited to. And then I got invited to the first Douglas Adams Memorial Lecture, which was given by Richard Dawkins, and, and the whole event was hosted by Stephen Fry. And during the uh, sort of standing around chatting, you know, and always oh, an awful it's and it's sad he's gone things. I happened to chat to John Lloyd and I'd been working on a book at the time. I was still a police officer at this time. Um, I'd been working on a book all about interconnectedness and how lots of different facts all connect to each other. Like, you know, you, you can connect, you can connect running shoes to the battle of marathon, you know, in, in a, in a fairly strange way, going by the fact that, uh, marathon is the Greek word for fennel and things like, you know, and, and Nike was God of victory and it all goes back to, um, you know, the battle of marathon and things like this. And, um, and John Lloyd said, being the sort of person here says, that sounds quite interesting. We're going to start doing QI annuals soon. Sounds like the sort of thing we could put in the annual. Here's my email address. Send me some stuff. Well, wow. now to, to explain, by the way, John Lloyd is a legend of British comedy, isn't he? So what's his pedigree? I suppose he's most famous for oh god! I suppose he's most famous for being the producer of every single episode of Blackadder. I mean, he he drove Blackadder, uh, but he also created Spitting Image, the great satirical puppet show. He created Not the Nine O'clock News, which launched the careers of Rowan Atkinson and Mel Smith and Griffith Jones, Pamela Steve. Um, he created the News Quiz, one of Radio 4's most popular things. When that when that transferred over to TV, that became Have I Got News for You, which is still going. Um, he created, as I said, he created QI. Um, he's got quite a CV. He's got quite a CV as John. So, you, a, you, a so he was guy. your link to, to write for the uh, for the annuals, and you started illustrating the annuals, didn't you? Or you illustrated? I mean, I, I wrote some stuff for the annuals, and then he found out I could draw as well. So I started doing illustrations for the annuals, and that sort of got me into the gang. So then I started going along to the recordings and meeting some of the other elves and things like that. So, and it just sort of took off from there, and John just said one day, do you want to write for the radio show, the Museum of Curiosity? And I said, yeah, I'll do some research for that. And um, then I ended up being one of the writers on that. And then ultimately I moved up to the TV show as a researcher or data miner. And then ultimately it was one of the scripters. So that that's the sort of path. It all started with me drawing a picture of a rhino and meeting Douglas Adams. That's how it all started. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, Douglas. Uh, wait, some some people's deaths I never get over. Douglas Adams is one of them. Uh, John Lennon is one yeah. of them. Just you know, even though I never met these, I mean, uh, you know, even worse if you'd met him. But um, do you, do, there are some people where you just think, oh my god, if they just lived. Like Steve Jobs is another one for me. I know. I'm, I'm very in the fact that I've met a lot of my heroes. I have met a lot of heroes. Um, there's some I never did, and you know. When you get asked that question about, you know, who would you love to meet more than anyone you've never did? I would love to have met P.G. Woodhouse, for example. Um, but I'm, I'm actually very lucky in the fact I've met most of my heroes. Um, and, and I'm also delighted to say that none of them have yet let me down. <laughs> I remember I remember meeting you at the pub and you, uh, once for drink and you, you showed me these photos of like <laughs> just like everybody you've ever heard of in British comedy. And... Um, uh, and, and but we should talk also about your book. So, so well, we talked about a couple of them already. Um, but one of your most recent ones, which I've been enjoying, and we might talk about how it's published, um, is "Murder to Die For." So, to explain uh, yeah. explain the concept of a murder to die for, which is a novel. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd done a lot of um, I'd done a bunch of nonfiction books, which you know, two of them were sort of all fact based, so they were they were sort of quite QI-ish, and I've done a couple of other things. Um, but I've always written stories, and I've always written novels, and I actually had a bunch of novels sitting on my computer at home I've never sent off for publishing, because um, I'm kind of a believer in that whole 10,000 hours thing, and um, I always felt you can't just write a novel and send it off and hope it's good enough. I, every novel I've written, I've got better. But I got to the stage where I thought I'd written one that was good enough. So I... I had an agent, obviously, and um, so I gave it to my agent, and he pumped it out to people. And what he got back was, "This is really good. This is the funniest book I've read in ages." Ah, oh, this this guy, he writes really, really well. But then there was the big but from everyone, which is, "But I don't know where I'd place it in the market at the moment," and that's a real issue because comic fiction is absolutely, you know, uh, humorous books is absolutely in the doldrums at the moment. Everyone just seems to be buying. Ripplet, uh, as they call it, or you know, Scandi Noir, or, or Misery Memoirs, and all these. Like, I know, and I, 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 what my absolute favorite are, are, are really, you know, there are very few humorous writers who can put together an entire book. I remember devouring the entire work of Dave Barry, the American humorist, and yeah, yeah. Uh, P.J. O'Rourke. But there is, there seem to be shockingly few people who can write whole books worth of, of funny stuff, but. Yes, I don't think there is. I don't think there is a, a, a lack of them. I think it's just that publishers won't take a chance on them. It, it's. I mean, you think back just fifteen years ago. You know, we had um, Sue Townsend, we had Tom Sharp, we had George McDonald Fraser, we had John Mortimer, we had Alan Corrin. You know, we uh, uh, there's Douglas Adams, obviously doing sci-fi, and Terry Pratchett doing fantasy, and you know, there was there was comedy everywhere on the bookshelves. Are you try and find any now. I mean, there are the occasional, you know, Jonathan Coe is still producing some nice witty stuff. Uh, John Niven's doing some good stuff still. <coughs> and there's quite a lot of, um, there's quite a lot of humor in, in the sort of romantic fiction market, you know, for want of a better name, the chiclet market. But it's really poorly represented in mainstream literary fiction at the moment. And I thought, you know, damn it, if I can't buy a new funny book, I'm going to write one. So I wrote one that I thought was good enough. And like I said, my agent pumped it around publishers, and they said, well, no one's buying humor at the moment. I said, yeah, because you're not publishing any. You know, how can you buy it? <laughs> so it just so happened that um, some friends of mine, in fact, a couple of the founders um, were actually working, people who worked on QI, uh, a new type of publishing called Unbound. And Unbound is a, it's kind of a hybrid model. It's it's not self publishing. It's not. I hate the term vanity publishing, but it's it's not self publishing or, or or you know raising the money for a book on Kickstarter or anything like that. It's a proper proper publishing house. So you you submit your manuscript or your agent submits it. They look at it. If they like it, they'll run with it. If they don't, they'll say good luck elsewhere. Once they've accepted the manuscript, once they've said yes, we like what you've done, um, it then switches to the hybrid part, which is crowdfunding where what you do then is you raise the funds to make the book a reality. Once that funding level is reached, you then hand it all back to Unbound again, and it goes through the same things that you go through with any other publisher. You go through you know, um, several different rounds of editors. Uh, it'll have proper proofreading. You get a proper designer and cover designer. 
Um, it's got a distribution network. The stuff gets out into the shops. And, you know, it's all they've done really is resurrect an old model. I mean, Dr. Johnson's first dictionary was published by public subscription. Uh, most of Dickens, most of Dickens' work was done by public subscription. I knew about Dickens. I didn't know about Johnson, right? Yeah, yeah. So all they've done is resurrected a new model and used the internet to make it happen. Um, and of course, you know, you can you can reach a lot more people with Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all the others that Dickens ever could, wandering around the streets trying to sell, you know, penny dreadfuls. So. Um, yeah, that was the model. I thought, I'll give it a try. And it worked. I got my funding. The book went out. It got put up for two awards. Um, and, you know, it's it, it pleased me immensely to be able to put a comedy book out into the marketplace. Because, God, eat them. I think, don't we need a laugh at the moment? But, it, but it's worth explaining that this is, well, I love the premise as well. This is a whodunit about a murder at a whodunit festival. Is that a fair description? Yeah, yeah. Well, you see, I... I, I I love classic murder mystery. I love Agatha Christie and, and you know, uh, and her ilk. And um, and I kind of fancied writing one of those. And I started writing one and I kept turning it into a spoof because everything about, I'm, I'm sorry, cozy crime listeners, but everything about Agatha Christie things is, is strangely silly when viewed through the lens of someone who's actually been a real police officer because I've been at real crime scenes. I've been at real homicide scenes. I've been involved in homicide investigations, and they're they're actually rather business like and rather dull and 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 procedural. You know, it's not. Mm, I couldn't help notice that the candle had only burned down one inch when it should have burned down. No, no, it's all rather different than that, and it relies a lot more on forensics and things like this and witness statements. Um, and I I always thought there was something funny about throwing those two cultures at each other. You know, having the murder mystery fans and police officers all who all believe that they can solve the crime and, and clashing over the fact they've got completely different methods, expectations and, and sort of understanding of what homicide consists of, what murder consists of. And I had the idea and I, I played around with it for a bit and it didn't it wasn't quite gelling. And then I happened to be going across to America to Comic-Con in San Diego, which if you haven't been, I think everyone should go to Comic-Con once in their life. It's the most mental convention you'll ever go to ever. Um, it used to be comics, as the name suggests. These days, comics form a very small part of it. It's mostly genre. It's mostly um, to do with movies and TV and that sort of thing. And, um, and Americans being Americans, everyone dresses up. Everyone cosplays. So you're walking along and you walk past sort of 10 different Spider-Mans. And then you'll walk past, you know, some Valkyrie walking past in a, in a metal breastplate. And then some guy is Mr. Fantastic with his long, blue, wobbly arms. And um, the year I was there was the year that um, 300 was um, one of the big films. And there's hundreds of really ripped guys with six packs in Trojan armor marching around in formation. It was, uh, it was amazing. But I was standing in a queue for a burger. And I, have to, I, I got a photograph of this. It was brilliant. I was, I was standing in a queue for a burger. And trying not to laugh, watching a guy dressed as Wolverine try to eat a burger without taking his eye out with his, with his own claws. And I suddenly heard this little group of guys dressed as Batman, sort of Tim Burton era Batman, bitching about some guys who were dressed as Adam West, 1960s era Batman. And then we go, oh God, look at those costumes. Oh my God, he looks so camp with those grey tights. And they started with all this body armor. And I thought, this is brilliant. There's this bitchiness between groups of fans, sort of inter-fan rivals. Convention. Oh my God, what if I set this whole murder mystery at a murder mystery convention? And that was it. That was the final element. And once that came together, the book just wrote itself. Absolutely wrote itself. Yeah. No, I love it. And I'm really enjoying it. And you're working on a second one, aren't you? Uh, well, it's done. It's, uh, it's out on July the 11th. It's called the Diabolical. Yeah, it's called the Diabolical Club. And it picks up a couple of strands from the first book and a couple of characters from the first book and runs with them. It's not so much a murder mystery, this one. I mean, there are two murders in it, and obviously those are investigated, but it's actually it's actually more a sort of um, village comedy. It, it's about the characters that live in the village and some of the ridiculous things they get up to as much as anything else, and there's a couple of murders woven through it. But it's, um, I, suppose the, I suppose what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to write something very similar to the sorts of things that my favorite writers were writing. I mean, you know, so take someone like Tom Sharp. I mean, he would take a very simple idea, such as a, a, a book like Wilt, for example, where Henry Wilt, who's a, who's a rather dull university lecturer, has these monstrous fantasies about killing his wife. 
which he knows he'll never be able to do. But when he's drunk one night, he ends up dressing up an inflatable doll in his wife's clothes and dropping it down a pit on a building site, which he knows is going to be covered with cement the next day. But of course, what happens is his wife, through totally different circumstances, goes missing and someone saw him throwing something down that hole. So the whole thing becomes a marvellous um, pulling apart of that situation where he's arrested for attempted murder. They're trying to burrow through the concrete to find his body, and, and he is sitting in the police um, police station being interviewed, knowing absolutely that he's innocent and running rings around the police. But this is why I, I love reading Tom that. Sharp. Yeah, uh, Tom Sharp would just take these very simple situations and just pull them out to the nth degree into you know farce and chaos with people being shot and explosions and things. And and I want I want more of that. I like that sort of thing. And you know Stella Gibbons, uh, Cold Comfort Farm, brilliantly funny book. Um, George MacDonald Fraser in his Flashman books. Uh, even in science fiction, people like Harry Harrison writing you know the the stainless steel rap books, things like this. I wanted to bring back that sense of English farce, you know, proper, proper English comedy, and and set it with an interesting group of characters. And yeah, that's what I've done with both books. And there's a third one next year as well. Oh, so I was going to ask, like, what's coming up next? So you're going to write a third book, but it will be related to these two. Yeah, it's kind of, um, it's not meant to be a trilogy because all three of them can be read completely in isolation of each other. You don't need to have read one to understand the others. But there's a character in A Murder to Die For, who at the end of the book, um, he's had a bit of a bad time throughout the first book. And I thought it would be nice to pick up like a couple of years later where he is now and how he's trying to get his life back on track. And that will be the third book. Um, but again, you don't need to have read the first book to, to get it, but I, I love writing comedy. I absolutely love writing comedy. And, and an awful lot of people who've read a murder to die for have said, um, God, this will make a great funny TV drama. So uh, I'm exploring that option at the moment as well. There's a, there's a couple of production companies have expressed an interest they haven't expressed interest enough yet to sign a contract or put any money up, but they've, um, they're looking at it, and they're quite big names as well. If I can get one of them off the ground, that'd be fabulous, because then you get one off the ground. If that's successful, they may want the sequel, and it just means, you know, write the book, TV series, write the book, TV series, and I'll, I'll be picking and shit, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's brilliant. Happen. I'd love to see that happen. I can imagine it being a good TV series. So um, that's been fantastic, um, Stephen. If you want to find out about all these billions of different things that you do uh, or have done, where's the best place to find out about them? Have you got a website? Well, I'm all over the place. I mean, I've got a very basic website, which is just www.stephencolgan.com. Um, we should explain that cool. it's, uh, for people listening, it's, it's Stephen with a Y, which is S-T-E-V-Y-N, Colgan. Yeah, S-T-E-V-Y-N. I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah, it's Stephen Colgan and C O L G A N, and um, it's a very basic website, but it, it's got jump off points to my blog, you know, to my Facebook page, to this, that, and the other. Um, I'm all over the place. So, I mean, there's a Wikipedia entry for me that someone's done. I don't know who. Up- it's a it's a it's a mystery, isn't it? Who updates Wikipedia pages? Yeah, I but assumed they- it was you to be honest, because I printed it off to, to for research. I know, I know who created it. Uh, my very first book deal was with Pam McMillan and they created my Wikipedia page and also a page for the book that they'd bought from me at the time, which was called joined up thinking. But since I've never done anything to it, but right. Well, someone's got a lot of detail in there, maybe your stalker or something. So <laughs> well, it's an, we had, um, I mentioned earlier that there was a radio series QI, that's the museum of curiosity on radio four. We did have Jimmy Wales on the guy who sort of created Wikipedia. And and he said, you know, he was looking at an audience of about 200 people. And he said, there'll be Wikipedians in this audience now who'll be updating my page now and the other people on the panel, even as we speak, to say they appeared on the Music of Curiosity, such and such. And he said, and one of the guys who was on the panel at the time was a Dutch um, biologist who didn't have a Wikipedia page on the English Wikipedia and Jimmy Wells said, yeah, he probably will by the time the show's ended, let alone when the show goes out. And sure enough, we checked at the end of the show and the Wikipedia page had been created for him. It's So I, I suppose there are people out there, probably because I worked on QIs, they're probably a QI fan, who because they got me in their sites because of that, then thought, oh, well, I'll keep a bead on that and I'll go and check every so often. I'll check his Facebook feed and his Twitter feed and see what he's doing and see what he's up to. Because, frankly, I don't know where half this information came from, but it's... I've only ever found a couple of bits on there that are wrong. Um, 
but they seem to have been corrected fairly quickly. But yeah, it's quite weird, but it's, it's no, it's not me. I, I wouldn't have a clue yeah. what it's stuff. I've got no well, idea if I... I've... I can barely get Skype working to talk to you today. I, I'm not a tech <laughs> at all. Well, no, it's great. It's great to speak with you. And um, I think people should go and find out all these things you're doing and, and look on um, unbound.com for your most recent books, but also the others are on Amazon uh, for definite because yeah, there's, there's going to be a book. All... One of your books will interest people because there's, there's such a range of them. So thank you very much, Stephen. I really appreciate that. Always a pleasure. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Ideas Lab podcast. Please do subscribe. And if you've enjoyed this episode, it would be great if you could leave us a review. You can get links and details of everything mentioned in the podcast in the show notes, along with photos and video clips from many of our episodes. Just go to theideaslab.org forward slash podcast.